well, the, there are going to be four of these things. Um, and I'm afraid to say they're about an obsolete technology. So you won't even get very far with this. Um, the first one, essentially, is on the period of the advent of artillery fortification. Now, I think these things are very interesting, and I'm going to try and say why. Um, one useful way of looking at this is to assume that we're looking back over the millennium. Okay, this is a kind of conventional device that we now adopt. And in architecture, you could make one clear and simple observation about European building for the greater part of that time say 85% of that time at least. Right? If you were Martian, viewing the planet's evolution slowly over that time. Two classes of structures stand out for their scale, their durability, and the sheer investment and effort expended upon them. And they are quite simply churches and fortifications. If you put it crudely, Europe invested in the means of physical and spiritual security. Okay, you should see the two as a kind of analogy because, of course, churches are one of the technologies of salvation. Right? They're thus a defense against eternal damnation. Right? At least within the traditions of popular piety, if you went to church often enough and kissed enough relics, you were probably going to get there. So walls without, churches within. That's what we spent our money on for 800 years. Right. Now, the interesting thing is if you look at architectural history, it's lavished its attention on churches. Right. And so is the heritage industry. But if we consider fortifications, the situation is different and rather curious. For the first 500 years of our period, the main form of fortification was the castle or the city wall. Right. Now, we regard these structures as romantic and picturesque. They're jolly nice ruins. Right. And they're much visited by the public and expensively maintained by heritage bodies. Right. But in the early 16th century, castles were supplemented and then replaced by artillery fortifications most modeled on the trace italienne, which is a polygonal structure with arrowhead bastions covering the curtain walls of the faces. Uh, let's have a, we might dim the lights a bit because these things are damn difficult to see. That's the standard thing we're talking about. Um, this is a very developed form of the thing, um, but you can see these the face, and so on. Now, um, this sort of fortress, and this is one from the late 17th century at Neuf Brissach, designed by Vauban, um, this sort of fortress survived for three centuries. It was basically a going concern from the 1530s to the 1850s. Um, it was the main form of defense of places in the second half of the century. Now, if you then ask, well, what do we make of these things? The answer is not very much. The Bastion Fortress and the more modern fortifications that replaced it have never enjoyed the same degree of interest from architects or architectural historians. And in the main, until recently, they've been ignored by the heritage industry and the general public. Now, you might say, well, actually, these things are really boring and it's not surprising. But I think the reasons, while sort of slightly different from that, are not hard to find. Firstly, many of these structures are difficult to identify, since they consist, when you look at them in the main, of earthen ramparts that barely show above a ditch covered by the earthen ramp of the glassy, the sloping ramp that comes up to these things, not well seen here. Um, now, so, you know, <laughs> They don't look very much. Often they have become city parks with mature trees over the top, and these further mask their features. 
In some cases, the fortifications are a decisive feature of the city, but they've disappeared. Think of the Ringstrasse in Vienna or the Peripherique in Paris, right? The fortifications were demolished, and then gradually things were built, but built on the basis of that belt of fortifications. Now, the other problem, basically, is this. That the elegance of this trace is difficult to see unless you possess a helicopter, it would appear. Now, here is an excellent example of one that's very well preserved. This is the town of Narden in Holland. You can see the Bastions very easily. But you can also see that unless you put an aerial view, this is rather difficult to see. Um, I just point this little one here out to you. It's called Sarzanello. It's in northwestern Italy. And it's the kind of most primitive form of modern fortification. And I'll refer to that later on again. So as you can see, these things are really not easy to con from ground level. Here is Palma Nova, a new fortification uh, in the plains northeast of Venice, and which, as you can see, is upside down. Um, I told you they're not easy to con. And here is a better right way up view of Palma Nova. Now, you can see the symmetry of Palma Nova. You see the bastions as you go around in the curtain wall, and you see a planned radial town within. This was a new foundation, fortress and city built together. But again, it's not something that you can immediately notice from the ground. Now, in 1977, the well-known art historian, J.R. Hale, raised the question of why these things were neglected. Right. Um, he said, in the mainstream of architectural history, fortifications are accorded but a fitful or embarrassed attention. They are historically important, but are they, can they be beautiful? Are they a proper concern of the historian of art, or should they be left to that rather drabber figure, the chronicler of engineering? That's his um, Walter Neurath Memorial Lecture, Fortification, Art, or Engineering. Now, the problem with Hale's view is that it's dominated by aesthetic considerations. I mean, he approaches these things in the manner of a rather snutty connoisseur. Seems to me always a mistake to approach ag uh, architecture. He said agriculture. I mean, these things are like agriculture. You have to dig up a lot of earth to put them in place. But, you know, first and foremost, it is a mistake, I think, to come. At, uh, you may want to raise aesthetic questions, but it's a mistake for one's analysis to be dominated by them. Now, the funny thing about Hale is that he recognized that the Renaissance polymaths who threw these things up would have regarded the question as utterly meaningless. Art or engineering, what is the guy talking about? You know, sure, some days we're artists, some days we're engineers, most days we're both, and we rest occasionally and get drunk, but you know, it isn't a problem for us. But clearly, in a sense, it was a problem for Hale. He couldn't put the categories together. And he, so he never wholly escapes from the clutches of this art or engineering problem in that discourse, which is a pity, because he had the knowledge to make a fascinating piece of work if he had done so. Now, there are several reasons why we should refuse this question of art and engineering and pose other and I think more pertinent ones. First, as I've said, architecture is not just about art. It is also, among other things, about power, control, and social significance. Now, you know, if we accept that until recently, <coughs> Europeans lived in an urban war world circumscribed by walls that both defended and yet controlled and sometimes dominated them, right? then we can begin to think again. Fortifications were, in one sense, a realm of power technique and not just military engineering. Not least, they facilitated the inspection and control of the populations who lived within and traded within. At night, the gates of the fortifications were closed, and by day, those entering and leaving were subject to inspection at the gates. 
In many cases, residents would depend on the will of the governor of the place, who had virtually draconian powers. Or he or the town council could control building within the walls and in the suburbs outside. So, in a sense, the governors of fortresses were the first town planners. The projectors of fortresses, like this one, were among the first modern town planners. Now, when these things were built, they were obviously built with defense in mind, but the whole city was built with a view towards control. Right? The radial city with a central place was built with the aim both of moving resources to the walls and, in a sense, marshalling the garrison against tumults. So this was a Venetian fortress designed to hold down the land around it and also to control the population within. Now, the history of fortifications as power over civilians remains to be written but it is a vital part of the European experience of urbanism into the 19th century and beyond. And those controls were real, right? Whether they enclosed a self-governing republic, like Luca in the picture, right? Or if they overawed rebellion, like the citadel that the Duke of Alva erected at Antwerp. Ah, <laughs> no, that's not Antwerp, that's Luca again. Uh, that's a picture of the ruddy place. Let's see. Now, here we've got the man himself trampling on Dutch liberty. Right? He's an ugly bastard. Um, but there is the citadel, its purpose to overawe the city. Now, so the first point, in a sense, is that there's at least a large story to be written about this form of fortification as a form of social control. Right? something that I will come back to. And I think maybe the most interesting way of viewing this architecture in the long run. But secondly, artillery fortifications mark a radical departure in the history of architecture. They're the clearest example before the penitentiary prison of space rationalized according to the demands of a clear functional program. Michel Foucault argued convincingly in his book, Discipline and Punish, that the panoptical prison subjects the structure to the rationalized demands of the principle of inspecting the inmates and to the requirement of a regime of control in order to facilitate the reform of the inmates. And this was initiated not by a new idea in architecture, rather, in a sense, the idea in architecture followed from a new conception of the function of incarceration as reform repentance. That's why they were called the penitentiary. So we have there a very clear example of how space could be organized according to a program. Now, the Bastion Fortress is as radical a domination of the structure by the spatial demands of its form and its use as is the uh, panopticon, artillery fortification, in its developed form, like that, is governed by geometry. There we are. Absolutely governed by geometry. Um, it is a space dominated Right. on the one hand by functional military demands and the resultant structures are in a sense a consequence of the logic of making fields of fire interlock right. rather than any immediately stylistic considerations. Okay. Now, the Renaissance fortification engineers subjected the whole space beyond the walls of the city to rationalization. The glasses, here, screens, Bastions dominate the land outside with their gunfire. Sweep the curtain walls and also, because these are proper ones, carefully designed, sweep the flanks of each other. So there's absolutely no dead ground that cannot be covered by gunfire. 
Um, now, this, I'll tell you later, this isn't, a you know, this isn't the most obvious solution to this problem. Right? But it is a systematic, easily replicable geometrization of the problem of artillery. It can be laid down on the ground, it can be drawn, it can be modelled. Right? And that's why it was popular. Now, as you can see, this is, an, I think, an exceptional architectural form, and it's of interest, right? precisely because, in a sense, it's an example of the demands of the geometry of artillery fire on the structure. And it works. There are a lot of reasons why the choice of the technology, evolution of the technology, is much more complex than that. But in its developed form, that's what it does, and it's interesting as such. Now, the third point I want to make about why these things are more interesting than art or engineering is that it by no means follows from this that the Bastion Fortress is an example of that long discredited axiom that form follows function. Here, form um, and function are intimately and reciprocally connected. And this solution is only one of a number that we might consider. There's no reason why artillery fortification should take this form consisting of arrowhead shaped structures flanking each other and the curtain walls. See, if you look at something like this, it was quite clear that that was not inevitable. Right? It was a clear solution to have arrow-shaped bastions flanking the curtain walls and each other. But other systems were possible. And we can look at examples from leading artists like Michelangelo or Dürer. Now here's Michelangelo's suggestion for how to fortify It's actually rather smart, if a bit complicated. Well, was Michelangelo, surprise, surprise. All right. Now, here's somebody who adopted a rather, it would appear, more basic thing. This is Albrecht Dürer's idea of how one might fortify. All right. Now, you think, oh Christ, this is primitive. But, I mean, apart from the fact that Dürer's fortifications would have used up half the bricks in Germany, um, it was something that people went back to. In uh, the 18th century, right, people started to say, well, these bastions actually are a bad idea, right? because they, in a sense, they're there to defend the curtain wall, but the curtain wall isn't doing anything. How can we defend the space? One idea that people came up with was to go to the Tanai Trace that you see below, the sort of sawtooth or scissors right. okay or oh sorry see I'm not an adept at this in the 18th century they decided to copy essentially Jura and 18th century experts like Carnot or Montalembert returned to the Renaissance idea of the multi-level gun tower as a means of providing a more effective fort, a new system of defense. Now, the reason that the Bastion Trace was adopted right, um, was really a function of the dominant ideas of how to rationalize space. 
there were a number of ways of doing that. And the polygonal form with symmetrical bastions was a likely solution, right? But it was only one of a number of possible Renaissance geometries for solving the problem of interlocking fields of fire, right? Um, now, the other reason, in a sense, that um, what happened happened as it did was that actually, through most of the six, fi late 15th and 16th centuries, heavy artillery pieces were incredibly scarce, a right, point I shall return to. Right. The reason nobody pays much attention to that in explaining why one of these types of trace rather than another was adopted is that, of course, architectural history and military history go sideways from one another and they don't interact. The truth is that because guns were very scarce, bastions were picked, right, because it was easy to move the few guns that you had to them, and secondly, it was easy to concentrate the guns on the flanks so that they prevented the walls being stormed, right? something you couldn't do with most of the other systems. So in the end, there was a military logic to this, why they tended to prevail, which was based on the fact that artillery was actually short there wasn't a lot of it. So the history of the development of this kind of fortress is very different from a simple and inevitable engineering solution to a problem. There were a range of other systems possible, and the choice of one technique over another cannot be understood in purely technical terms. The issues at stake, therefore, are wider than art or engineering. The histories that need to be brought to bear are intellectual, political, and economic, as much as they're aesthetic or technical. And we might say that it's equally important that we think carefully about the influence of Neoplatonism and the geometries of Neoplatonism on Italian Renaissance fortification engineers, and that we understand when and how the Swedish and English iron industries developed that made guns plentiful. Then it is that we worry about whether these things are beautiful or not. So we have other options than regarding them as art or engineering, and I think these are useful. The last point I want to make is that actually, of course, unlike most tourists standing there in the Hawaiian shirt with their camera around their neck, Renaissance and early modern publics had a way of seeing the beauty and symmetry of the fortresses that they lived in. Mm -hmm. um, because printing made possible good engravings. And people like Brown and Hagenberg, right, um, and, uh, uh, sorry, I was going to run on to another one, uh, who in the very famous late 16th century book, uh, Civitas Orbis Terrarum, right, showed all the cities in plan perspective, showing their bastions, their details, their churches, and so on. So people could say, that's what it looked like. They knew what the city looked like, because if you're a reasonably prosperous burger, you could buy a book with a picture of your town in it. And if you were not that prosperous, you could buy a single woodcut or possibly an engraving of your town. So you knew what it looked like. Mm -hmm. Moreover, when you entered the city, um, your experience of the city was richer and more varied than it often is today because the gates had been kept intact. Now, of course, not many modern cities keep their gates intact because they're attracted. that arrest you and grill you. Now, um, and of course, these gates usually showed off, in this case, the arms of the city. Right? In other cases, you have elaborate structures showing you arms and busts of Mars and all that kind of thing. Um, now, of course, the gates are the one feature where style and significance is particularly important. Right? Don't imagine, it's sim on the other hand, that it's simply because um, 
The rest of it is purely utilitarian. In a sense, it has its own aesthetic. If you try and tart up right, the rest of it, it's not only the case that it just presents targets for artillery, artillery fire. People did try to do this in cases, and it simply looked terrible. You know, when they had elaborate turrets at the edge of the bastion and scroll work and all that kind of thing. People said, no, 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 this is naff, we won't do it. So there was an aesthetic and symbolic experience of the fortified place, but it was very different from our experience today. We don't experience passing through these gates as the citizens of the Renaissance. Did. We don't experience looking at the engravings that you had from people like Brown and Hardenberg or the Merriam brothers. Um, in the same way, we take these things absolutely blasé and we don't think about it. For people then, they were like, you know, people seeing pictures of the Earth from space in the 60s. So, in a way, that argument that, oh, well, you can't appreciate these things wasn't true in the Renaissance, although I think it's profoundly true today that you put the average tourist up against the walls of Lucca or Narden or Palma Nova, no, oh, what's this? Um, and they don't know what it is and they can't imagine it, whereas people in the Renaissance could. Now, I think we have to see the fortress in the following way, as a kind of equivalent to a total phenomenon, as the famous French anthropologist Marcel Mousse called it, um, in which several aspects of life are rolled together and can only be analyzed as such, bringing a multiplicity of disciplines to bear. Architectural, military, and socio-economic history need to be combined to explain how the fortress came to be built, and also how it functioned. No single one will suffice. Now, there are a number of good models for this work, um, and we need to consider how fortifications are used if we're to understand them. Because in the end, the fortress is an ensemble right, of means of fighting, including weapons, tactics, military skills, and strategic objectives. One cannot appreciate it as a building unless one takes that into account and also the peacetime social control that it made possible, to which I alluded earlier. Now, the important point is this. Why are these fortifications so numerous? The answer is because for the greater part of the millennium, <coughs> sieges far outnumbered battles. The defense of places was the central part of war and their capture was the principal strategic objective of war. Now, the simple continuity here is that, in a sense, sieges were the normal form of war from the Crusades until Napoleon. There were ten sieges for every battle. This is a kind of, if you like, military long durée. It's a kind of one of those fundamental sort of continuities about technology, organization, in medieval and early modern society that one can look at over a period of 800 and so years. Mm -hmm. And chief of the factors was that armies couldn't actually stay in the field throughout the year. Mm -hmm. In the summer, an army could march all over the country of a theater of operations, and yet it would have to withdraw without effect unless it could find winter quarters. These would inevitably be in a defended place, and the invading army could not acquire that place without a siege. Um, most armies, anyway, had to dissolve because they couldn't be paid or fed through the winter anyway, let alone whether they could find somewhere to hold up. So that meant that you had to besiege a place and get it, preferably in the summer. Secondly, the economic limitations on the size of armies throughout most of the millennium and the dreadful conditions of the roads and the limited food surpluses in any place um, limited the uh, objectives that you could pursue in war into the late 18th century. Mm -hmm. The best you could do was to capture one or two key, key, key fortified places um, and capture as a result by controlling the forts of a region or a province. So, Warfare could seldom be decisive, save by steady attrition. Hence, we find the long struggle of the Muslims to chuck the Crusaders out of Syria and Palestine, the Hundred Years' War over the English attempt to build an empire in France, and the Eighty Years' War in which Spain sought to subdue the Netherlands. 
These are all basically wars of sieges. Right? There's nothing else to it. So cities were basically a way of dominating the countryside. And in all but a handful of pacified regions in Europe, they were the norm. Urban space had to be defended space. Sieges, as we shall see next time, were part of the normal experience and expectation of urban dwellers. And fortifications were an ambiguous but mainly welcome source of security. Now, the continuity in the military and social role of defended places between the year 1000 and 1800 is in contrast to the fundamental discontinuity of their form. Castles right, are the normal form right, until the late 15th century. So we tend to think, oh Jesus, they must have been round forever. But they weren't. Right? If you look at the year 1000, right, Europe had pitifully few stone buildings in it. The few that there were were churches. Most buildings were wattle and daub. Um, and it's only after the year 1000 that Europeans start to build massively in stone. Obviously, they'd done so up until the 6th century. But there's a period of several hundred years in which people don't build in stone after the decline of the Roman Empire. So castles were new. Right? And at first, let's go through these gates. They were like this. They were pretty simple stuff using piled earth and uh, wooden palings, mops and bailey castles, easy to erect and easy to use. These things were basically used to seize territory, as the Normans did in England, or the Germans did um, in the bits of Eastern Germany and then Poland that they, they captured. Right. But stone castles were something new. They're an index of centralization, the formation of monarchies and empires. And they are used, in a sense, to control that's another mot and bailey. Let's get rid of it. Here we are. They're used to control the surrounding territory. This is crack in, uh, in Syria. It's a, a fortress built by the Crusaders to dominate the territory in question. And it's a very smart and modern idea. Um, here's another one, Bomaris in Wales. Again, a sophisticated fortress designed to extend English rule to Wales. These things were intended to control territory. Um, and they were frequently strategic in their location. And only either the greatest barons or monarchs could build in stone for a long time until European wealth got much more considerable in the 13th century and beyond. Cities tended to buy rights of fortification quite late. They put up serious walls, mainly in the 13th and 14th centuries. Okay. Now, these fortifications are therefore a new departure in Europe. They're not an age-old form. And this led some people to think, well, actually, they must be an early form of technology transfer. Right? They must actually arise from the European experience of crusading and that they got the idea of these sophisticated fortresses from the Muslims or from the Byzantines. Well, this has been shown to be rather a mistake, um, not least by a well-known man called Smale, who wrote a book on crusading warfare that I think demonstrates this. But the simple point why it isn't likely is that the forts aren't like, except in the basic sense, Byzantine forts. Um, and a society that could build the cathedrals could certainly run these things up. It wasn't a problem to think of them. It's an index not of learning from the experience of the Crusades, but in the sense of the growing wealth from political centralization of Europe. However, right, um, what the castle was for, to put it crudely, is to create a deliberate imbalance between the forces needed to defend it and the forces needed to attack it. These things would create a series of nodes of control in the countryside from which their garrisons could be gathered together to form a field army. And they could still be held by quite small forces. 
This is how they functioned um, in, in the case of the Crusades. And they were basically defended by missile fire. They were defended by crossbowmen, catapults, that kind of thing, firing through the numerous slits. And you can see that in a crude way, the towers flank the walls just as bastions later on are to do, and that the outer lines of defense are overruled by the inner ones. So this kind of fortification was not less sophisticated in certain ways. Right. Than is the later one. To see these things as if you know, these were primitive and the later ones were complex is wrong. This was a complex solution to one technical problem. Mm -hmm. The technical problem of having relatively small numbers of persons defended in the case of a siege, mainly by missile fire. The Bastion Fortress is a response to artillery. Now, the interesting point, I suppose, is this, that artillery was around for roughly 100 years before you get the most developed forms of modern bastion fortresses, and it was quite effective. Right? In 1453, two things happened. The English were finally kicked out of France. Right? They were blown out of France by the French artillery created by the Bureau brothers. And a Byzantine, Byzantine and Venetian technology transfer to the Turks enabled them to blow down the walls of Constantinople. But, okay, this is good news, you might think. Technology transfer, these things are happening. Fortresses do not change that much. Right? They tend to be, um, they tend to get a bit lower, the walls get much thicker, and they have more gun ports. And that's how things go on for some time. They don't tend to turn right, immediately from this into bastions. Now, the dominant way of looking at that is to see all the intermediate fortifications between, say, 1450 and 1530 as kind of ways to solve a problem, bad mistakes, right, rather than, in a sense, seeing them as fairly effective castles. Now, there is no doubt that the French invasion of Italy in 1494 shocked everybody because Charles VIII's artillery was massively more efficient than anybody else's had been, and he did blow away a lot of Italian fortifications. The fact that a lot of them were not in a first-class state, uh, were ill-maintained and worse defended, is neither here nor there, for what it's worth. Okay. Now, the point is, what I want to try and say to you, there's the sophisticated forms that we're not going to have a lot of time to talk about. These sorts of things, right? this is a place called Sasso Corvara. shouldn't be seen right, as a mistake. Okay. Um, now, there is a long period in which perfectly effective modifications of the castle are built, right, but also people are basically exploring 
were there already, the problem in a sense for everybody was that there simply <coughs> there were not the technical pressures that there were supposed to be. Why? Well, because guns were not that numerous, to put it crudely. Okay? Um, if you look, um, for example, um, here is one of uh, Francesco de Giorgio's fortresses in plan. Here it is in uh, design, and you can see that it's a nice compromise. It has the articulations along the wall, it shoots underneath, damage will drop bloody red bricks on people's heads, and it has strategically pointed ports for cannon. It's an extremely effective design for where it is, again, on a rather restricted urban site. And in fact, you could do almost anything you liked if you were artful enough. This is an illustration of the Siege of Siena in 1655. Right? What you'll find, in fact, is that the walls are pretty primitive. The bastion here has been destroyed and the bridge made. And what they've done is to build a retrenchment within. Retrenchments were as effective as the walls themselves within reason. So you could quickly fortify a medieval city, which is roughly what the Sienese did after 1527 um, in response to a previous bad experience, and their fortifications held up remarkably well in 1555. So what we can see here is that you could actually solve these problems quite well without devising Bastion. Here's another example of Michelangelo. It's an idea of how you strengthen the medieval walls of Florence. Okay. Now, if I say, and I come back to the point, that because artillery was scarce, it was actually by no means the case that the great big bastions that I showed you at the beginning in the fully developed form of Neuf Brissage were much use. Right? In fact, you didn't have the guns to use them. So what did you do with the guns? Well, above all, you needed to protect them against the enemy's guns and cover the curtain wall. Right? And you can see here right, um, a series of guns pointing along the curtain wall, giving flank and fire. If cannons were few and far between, you didn't expose them on the ramparts. You dug them in to cover the walls against a last-ditch attack and hope to disrupt the enemy's siege by uh, raids and so on. Now, I've been talking about the military history of this because it's worth saying that, in a sense, the fortifications that we're looking at right, evolved in a period when artillery was scarce, when crossbows were more effective than the early form of musket, right, when it rained a lot, even in Italy, right, and people often fought hand to hand. Right? So there's a period of 100 years right, in which fortifications were designed not only to resist artillery, but also to avoid being stormed. Right? Um, and if you want to see what sieges could be like, then the great siege of Malta right, in the middle of the uh, um, 16th century right, provides us with an example because to put it absolutely crudely as it were um, the fights of Fort St. Elmo was a badly designed and small fort on, on the tip you know, of a peninsula and the hand to hand fighting for it was intense right? and in the end it consisted of the Maltese knights of the hospitallers right? standing in the breaches in full armour with Toledo swords fighting the Turks hand to hand. They could have done this in the year 1200 in the Crusades. Right? There's a fundamental continuity still in military technology, which means 
it's a pretty long time. And we have to analyze the structures that emerged in that period as a variety of features competing under the conditions of the technology based on various possible ideas about how to fortify space. And above all, conditioned by the fact that actually guns were not as effective as they were supposed to be, and big ones, because they were made out of drums, were so expensive that people didn't have many. Right? Which is why, for example, throughout the 15th and 16th centuries in the Mediterranean, wars were fought between galleys, between rowing boats. Right? Why? Because actually, if you'd wanted to fight a war with ships with lots of guns, you wouldn't have had the option because you didn't have the ruddy guns. Right? So people say, oh, well, why was warfare in the Mediterranean so backward? Answer, the Italians and the Spaniards were short of artillery. Why was the English fleet so well gunned at the time of the Spanish Armada? Answer, the English iron industry had enabled them to cast cheap guns. Right? The Spaniards were having to buy them. Right? So you have to know, in a sense, crude facts of economic history to understand structures. Now, that may sound too reductionist, but the point is we can see at one and the same time, if I wrap this up, in a sense, the definite gradual predominance of a particular kind of structure, the arrowhead bastion in a regular polygonal trace. But this doesn't come quickly. The structures that are thrown up that don't look like it aren't like made by dumb people who don't know what they're doing. Nobody, by and large, bought rubbish. People bought defensible places. And the systems that, in a sense, didn't take off like, for example, the Tanai trace, the dog trace that you saw. The reason that didn't take off is not only that it was more difficult to defend, uh, except by artillery, and artillery was scarce, but also because it was difficult to adopt to irregular or hilly sites. Right? And actually, probably about half the fortifications that were going to get built were built on irregular or hilly sites. Right? You can't lay on that sort of trace where it changes levels, which you can lay on curtains and bastions as they change levels. And that's one of the reasons that that happened. One should also remember, crudely put, that for all this talk about fortifications, ill-defended towns like Montalcino during the Florentine uh, War against Siena in uh, 1555, this place was defended literally without any regular One has to remember, as I shall try and show later, that there is, in a sense, an entire improvised, uh, impermanent architecture of fortification, which you can associate with sieges. Um, now, there you are. These are the primitive guns that I was talking about that are rather scarce. That's a gun in the rocker of Mondavio that I showed you before. Okay. Um, we can put the lights on now, somebody's. Thank you. Okay, we've got a little time for questions. I'm sort of aware that I've hurried through bits of it, and if anybody thinks I haven't covered the points properly, I'm quite happy to try and explain them. We have a few minutes. Yes.
depends. I mean, if you look at Italy, for example, right, and Spain, right, um, you will, and parts of the Alps, it's not all, you know, nice flat on the ground in the plaza, you will find actually, and in a large part of the Rhine Valley, right, that the sites are hilly. Now, the other thing one would note, in a sense, is that a lot of the warfare that one is concerned with in the earlier part of this is taking place in, for example, central Italy. Right? Now, in that period, right, um, it's by no means the case that the Basque trace is just the kind of grab it out of the design locker and plop it on the 4-4. In other words, I'm saying that certainly in Italy, at the time when the possibility of using a Tanai trace, for example, and a Bastion tress were there, it would have been the case that a large number of the sites to be fortified were actually hilly. Right? They weren't all in the Po Valley. A lot of them were in central Italy, where some of the hardest fighting took place. Right? Well, it, you know, if you look, for example, at the sort of terrain in which the wars between Spain, France, Florence, and Siena, for example, or fought, fought or a lot of the terrain in southern Italy, this stuff is actually hilly. Right. So, you know, I mean, I take your point that later on that is true, that you're sort of plopping them down in the Netherlands where it's nice and flat, right? But of course, in those circumstances, the Tanai trace would have been equally possible. Right. But all I was saying really was that earlier on, right, you know, when you have these attempts to sort out what to do, right, there would have been some pressure against adopting the Tanai because it is, um, it is less easy to replicate, you know, for fairly obvious reasons, on a hilly site. So let's agree, <laughs> if you see what I mean. I mean, I think it's, you know, what you're saying is true, and what I'm saying is true, it's a matter of place and temporality. citizens rebelled, demolished it, the city was besieged, it was eventually recaptured, and so on and so on and so on. So the experience of urban life in this period is very, very mixed. I mean, you have to ask yourself whether the walls are a protection or not. Right? It depends for who. Right? For the useless mouths of the city, um, they could actually be a death trap if they were not fed. Some cities had public stores and tried to feed all their people, like some of the Hanseatic cities and some of the public. Others just simply took it, you know, they were kind of 
uh, they were Gingrich sort of regimes before their time. You know, that if you hadn't laid in your reserves and you went hungry, well, tough luck. So they could be pretty rough places to live in, it seemed. And I'll spend more time talking about, in a sense, the role of the siege and the wars and the experience of urbanism. I've got other things to do at the